Please know I'm an oncologist by training. I have no um, real experience in ASD, but I did want to share with you some of the work we've been doing in neuro disease. And really, we we're trying to just make this available as a potential collaboration with anyone who might be interested in this. I think some of the science that we'll show you with the existing neuro patients that we've treated have some validity and cross sort of um, uh, a discipline approach with, with ASD. So with that, please understand that I'm coming from it from a wholly uh, agnostic uh, oncology perspective. Um, my wife and I have some very dear friends with kids, beautiful kids with ASD, and if we can try to come up with ways to try to help improve the, the lives of uh, the families and the children, that's what we would love to do. Um, so, uh, as I mentioned, we are a company that's focused on natural killer cell therapy. And initially when we were starting with this, we really looked at natural killer cells in the context of human health. Um, first of all, for those of you who are not familiar with natural killer cells, they represent roughly about 5 to 10 percent of our entire uh, immune system. While people have focused on red blood cells and white blood cells, these are a type of white blood cell, but they're the first line of defense when your body actually produces cancer cells, when it has virally infected cells. It's the natural killer cells that seek them out first because they have the ability to recognize self from non-self. Uh, what we're now learning about natural killer cells are they're associated with numerous diseases, meaning if you have either decreased numbers of natural killer cells or weak deficient natural killer cells, it's been correlated with everything from autoimmune disease to cancer to uh, even neurological diseases. So uh, with that in mind, we set out to develop uh, very enhanced non-genetically modified natural killer cells. In general, natural killer cells are very, very difficult to grow. If somebody were co to come to you, draw your blood and isolate your natural killer cells, most companies would only be able to get about 30%, meaning three out of 10 of you, uh, your natural killer cells to grow. But we have a platform that allows us to get anyone's NK cells to grow to large quantities. But if you have weak NK cells, meaning the NK cells don't have much killing potential behind it, or for some reason they don't have the ability to recognize self from non-self, uh, the second thing that we're able to do is really dramatically increase the activating receptor expression. And what I mean by that is, as part of our US FDA filing, we had to show, particularly when you're dealing with advanced cancer patients, that you could get every single cancer patient's natural killer cells to grow. Imagine being enrolled in a trial, going to this process only to be told, oh, we couldn't get your cells to grow. So the first is just up on the bug. When we took NK cells from healthy subjects versus taking natural killer cells from heavily pretreated cancer patients, we could get each of their NK cells to grow. Now again, if you take one weak NK cell and turn it into a million and give these back to patients, we would argue that this would not be biologically beneficial to the patient. So the second thing on the right is cytotoxicity, meaning the killing potential of NK cells. And the dotted line represents, if I was to, at this point, draw your blood, isolate your resting natural killer cell, and plate it on a plate of leukemia cells at various ratios. If you go all the way to the right, at a ratio of 0.5 to 1, we took five of your healthy NK cells against 10 leukemia cells, you don't see much killing at those ratios. But after we've had a chance to grow and amplify and activate your NK cells, not only have we been able to produce billions of these, but now you can see we've dramatically increased the killing potential but without any genetic modification. And then the final part, which, and all of this will make sense when I show you in the context of neuro and specifically ASD, is Unlike T cells, which indiscriminately can attack good and healthy cell, uh, disease cells in your body, NK cells can di di distinguish uh, healthy cells from disease cells by the use of various receptors. And this is just showing you from day zero to day 17 during our process, how we're able to get very heightened receptor expression. So when these cells go back into the patient, they're very, very powerful in terms of killing potential, but also very discerning in terms of only focusing on those cells in our body that shouldn't be there. Um, and so it's a very simple process. We draw blood, we do the manufacturing, and we deliver it back to the patients. They're very, very powerful in terms of killing potential, but also very discerning in terms of only focusing on those cells in our body that shouldn't be there. Um, and so it's a very simple process. We draw blood, we do the manufacturing, 
and we deliver it back to the patients. Um, now, I just want to show you a little bit of the data that we have in treating two diseases that are traditionally not thought to be treatable, which is Parkinson's and Alzheimer's. And the reason I want to point these out is to show you, one, that we have human data using our cells in neuro diseases, but some of the uh, disease processes of these I've come across also exist in ASD. Um, so first and foremost, what we know about uh, both Alzheimer's and Parkinson's is they have two different proteins. So in Parkinson's, you have a protein called alpha-synuclein. In Alzheimer's, you have a, uh, uh, a protein called tau. And for one reason or another, these accumulate in the brain. And what we're now starting to realize is as they accumulate in the brain, the NK cells, if they're weak, allow the accumulation to occur much quicker, both in Parkinson's disease and in Alzheimer's disease. And in fact, when they've taken animal models and removed the NK cells, it's allowed the proteins to grow and deposit even quicker than they were when the NK cells were there. The next thing is that these proteins, as they start to accumulate, elicit a robust uh, autoimmune neuroinflammatory response. So those uh, T cells that I mentioned start to proliferate and cross the blood-brain barrier and they get into the brain in the attempt to remove these proteins. But in doing so, they end up causing a tremendous amount of inflammation and damage to the healthy surrounding brain. And this is both true for the alpha-synuclein and for the amyloid proteins. And I just want you to keep that in the back of your mind, these T cells, because when I show you some data in ASD, you'll see that these are the exact same T cells that are causing neuroinflammation in kids. Um, and then if you look at uh, uh, people with autism, I mean uh, Parkinson's disease and Alzheimer's, what they're also found to have is a much higher incidence of autoimmune diseases. 33% um, overall excess risk of Parkinson's disease if you have an underlying autoimmune disease and very similar for um, Alzheimer's as well. And just to show you that when you take patients with active autoimmune disease, whether it be rheumatoid arthritis, uh, multiple sclerosis, inflammatory bowel disease, and we all know that a lot of kids with ASD have autoimmune disease. If you were to isolate the NK cells and look at their killing potential or the number of cells, you'll see that uh, all autoimmune diseases are associated with weak or impaired or decreased numbers of natural killer cells. And just to show you, uh, we've done a lot of trials in cancer in the United States. We did a lot of trials combining our cells with what we call immune checkpoint inhibitors. They're the new class of cancer drugs that unleash the immune system to attack a patient's tumor. But in doing so, they also unleash the immune system to attack the patient's uh, normal healthy structures. And this is just to show you that in the existing literature that if you have an immune checkpoint inhibitor therapy, you have about a 20% chance that you're gonna end up in the hospital with inflammatory bowel disease-like symptoms. Uh, roughly a 20% chance you're gonna end up in the hospital with uh, a rash that looks like psoriasis and other uh, autoimmune phenomena. And it's that same T cell that I mentioned that attacks the protein in the brain and causes neuroinflammation that is also causing damage uh, from the immune checkpoint inhibitors. And the reason I wanna point this out is in our US clinical trials, we've now done three clinical trials roughly about 60 total patients, not only have we shown that adding our NK cells to immune checkpoint inhibitors has resulted in better cancer outcomes, but what was really striking is that we eliminated the 20% uh, immune checkpoint toxicity. Um, and how this happens is that NK cells are found to identify, have the ability to identify and eliminate those autoreactive T cells. So those same T cells that are causing inflammation in the brain in all, um, um, Parkinson's and Alzheimer's are the same T cells that cause damage from immune checkpoint inhibitors. And the way that NK cells can identify and eliminate these autoreactive T cells are through two, two receptors. One is called DNAM1, and the second one is NKG2D. And just to show you down in the lower left-hand corner, when you look at our NK cells after we've expanded and activated them, they have over 95% NKG2D expression and over 99% DNAM1 expression. So when we put these back in the patients, they're highly attuned to identify and then eliminate these autoreactive T cells. Uh, and then the final thing I just want to set the table for is that NK cells have also been found, this is studies 
done at Boston Children's Hospital that they can help identify and eliminate damaged neurons. So uh, they can not only help to slow down the protein uh, deposition, they can help with the removal of proteins, they can help cool off the brain by identifying and eliminating these autoreactive T cells, and the final part is they can clear out some damaged neurons that have been chronically inflamed. Um, and so one of the questions people ask is how do you know that your NK cells can cross the blood-brain barrier? This chemokine that I'm going to show you has also been implicated in neuroinflammatory conditions uh, in ASD. And what they did was when, this was a study that looked at patients who had Alzheimer's disease, multiple sclerosis, a lot of chronic neuroinflammatory conditions. And when they looked at the T cells in those patients, they found they all had very high CXCR3 expression. The other thing they found was uh, a, a, a chemokine called CXCL10, which was, they found that CXCL10 positive astrocytes were often associated with amyloid deposits. So the idea is that the amyloid or the alpha-synuclein deposit in the brain, they have very high levels of CXCL10, and then the T cells, because they have this very high CXCR3 expression, cross the blood-brain barrier and attack those specific areas of the brain. And in fact, when you do autopsy studies of patients with Alzheimer's disease and you stain the brain for CXCR3, you see them uh, highly uh, stained in the neocortex, striatum, cerebellum, and, um, uh, uh, um, uh, sorry, ne uh, neocortex, uh, uh, striatum, uh, hippocampus and cerebellum, and in fact, those are the areas that are most damaged in most neuroinflammatory conditions like Alzheimer's. Um, and same thing with Parkinson's, the same uh, chemokines have been implicated. So just to show you that again, in addition to our cells having high expression of DNAM1 and NKG2D that allows them to identify damaged neurons and autoreactive T cells, they also have high CXCR3 expression which allows them to follow these T cells across the blood-brain barrier and then seek out and destroy them. Um, so we actually, based on this, uh, took a few patients with advanced, uh, really end-stage terminal neuro diseases, uh, and we treated them. Uh, the first was a 38-year-old gentleman who actually was living up in the Bay Area. He was a Stanford grad, he was a computer programmer. He was getting lost on his way to work. Ended up at UCSF was eventually found to have a rare genetic mutation called PSEN1, which basically guaranteed before the age of 50 he would have full-blown Alzheimer's. You can see the PET scan result uh, uh, to, the, to the left. When we met him, he couldn't talk, couldn't walk, couldn't feed himself. He was in hospice and requiring 24-hour care. Uh, we uh, found his, uh, our CFO or our company found uh, his wife uh, knew the family, there was a GoFundMe page, so we contacted the family and we said, we don't know if this is going to work, but we have some rationale that our NK cells could potentially uh, help improve the, uh, your brother's condition, and the brother uh, agreed to let us do this. So again, when we met him, we couldn't, uh, he couldn't walk, couldn't feed himself, and was wheelchair dependent, um, and couldn't talk. This is after now five uh, doses given once a month, of our cells. So not only was he able to, I would argue it's hard enough to get out of a, a, a wheelchair, let alone get out of a car, which is much lower. He was able to get out of the car, walk, and then he was able to comprehend that he needed to close the door. This is him actually feeding himself, and he had not fed himself in two years. What are you eating? Uh, you like it? Yeah. Awesome. You want to try eating with yourself? Yeah. Okay. Do you remember how to use a chopstick? Yeah. Okay. Well, let's see. Yeah. 
And I should add that the head of Alzheimer's at UCLA independently saw and validated everything that happened with these patients that I'm going to show you. The last thing I'm just going to show you with regard to Daniel is while he was sleeping uh, at his um, uh, facility, the nurse took a picture of him at nighttime. You could see his legs waking up, and it was almost as if new neural networks were starting to connect. Um, so then we took another lady, 72-year-old from New York, uh, with advanced Alzheimer's. Again, these are patients that don't qualify for any clinical trials because they're too end stage. Most of the clinical trials really focus on mild cognitive impairment. And when we met her, she couldn't remember her kids' names. She, could only, uh, she could, uh, couldn't remember her siblings' names, her husband's name, that she lived in New York. Um, after several treatments, she was able to remember her kids' names, three of her four siblings, that she knew her husband's name. She was much more conversant. And this is her husband took a picture of her actually riding a bicycle, a uh, video of her, and sent it to us. Uh, and then we have another lady that we were treating in Korea that went from a mini mental status score of 12 up to 22. Uh, 12 is severe dementia and 22 is moderate, uh, mild dementia. And then we took a gentleman with advanced Parkinson's disease as well uh, that uh, clearly had cognitive uh, overall improvement. Uh, and this was the basis for a clinical trial now that we have ongoing in advanced Alzheimer's. Again, not the mild cognitive impairment, but we're taking patients that would really be too advanced to qualify, uh, and we're seeing some really uh, encouraging signals early at our lowest doses. And then we just announced an agreement with the Parkinson's Foundation to do a trial with, uh, in Parkinson's in the first quarter of this coming year. So that leads me now to uh, what is the potential, or is there a potential for NK cells in ASD? Uh, and really this is based on several papers that I've come across that people have at some point or another looked at immune dysfunction in kids with ASD. Uh, they looked at the role of natural killer cells. This is just showing you when they drew blood from various kids with natural killer cells and tried to stimulate them that they were very, very weak compared to healthy uh, kids that didn't have uh, ASD. Uh, the figure on the uh, right is from a different study that looked at clinics that specifically treated kids with ASD versus a uh, pediat uh, standard pediatric uh, clinic, and you can see the proportion of kids that have neurological, dis I, uh, uh, I'm sorry, um, and immunological dysfunction, and specifically weaker NK cells, which are much higher in kids with ASD. And then if you look at the work, that, the great work that's being done at UC Davis, uh, both from uh, Dr. Paul Ashwood and um, uh, Judy Vandermeter, who I've been uh, consulting with regularly on this, They've found, again, that NK cells from kids with ASD are sufficiently weaker uh, and that there's an overall either decreased number or decreased cytotoxicity of NK cells uh, that they've seen through numerous publications, K cells uh, that they've seen through numerous publications. Uh, there was a study that was actually done in adults where they drew blood from adults uh, with uh, uh, ASD and they actually found uh, that the degree of functioning was correlated with how well their NK cells could uh, continually uh, thrive after being rechallenged. Um, and then, if we look at, you know, uh, again, I am not a uh, ASD or a neurology expert in any way, and I know it's a multifactorial disease. But if you look at just one component of this, that at least uh, uh, some researchers have focused on. They have focused on uh, the sort of peripheral immune dysfunction. They've looked at uh, dysfunctional NK cells and, all, again, hyperactive T cells. Um, uh, and then if you look at the incidence of autoimmune disease in children with ASD, uh, these are various studies that looked at um, um, the, the, you know, that kids with ASD, or if they looked at, Kaiser once looked at all the kids that they had with autoimmune disease and found that a larger percentage of them also had ASD compared to those children that didn't have an autoimmune disease. The most common autoimmune diseases in children with ASD they found were either psoriasis, skin-like conditions, or inflammatory bowel disease. And we know that if you look at uh, natural killer cells from, kid, uh, from people with psoriasis, they're very, very weak in terms of cytotoxicity uh, and uh, compared to people that don't have psoriasis. So if you just look again at the uh, 
potential of NK cell dysfunction and also autoimmune disease. And what I showed you in terms of how NK cells can identify and eliminate these T cells that are causing the damage, uh, there is that common link across all of these other neurological situations. And then this was some work that was done um, with Jun Ha and his lab, and I had been in discussions with him uh, to serve as an advisor as we look into this. But specifically, he looked at um, the, a, a specific cytokine called IL-17A, and they were looking at it within the context of maternal gut bacteria. Well, we know that IL-17A actually decreases NK cell activity and killing in cancer patients. So again, if you look at all of these things that are pointing to some weakening or uh, dysfunction of NK cells, uh, there is uh, some common elements here. Um, and then the whole idea of neuroinflammation during pregnancy, right? There could be a lot of situations that occur, um, you know, everything from uh, an autoimmune disorder in the uh, mom to an infection to pollution to high fat diets. One way or another, that causes this infl inflammation in utero. And then uh, after the uh, child is born, uh, they, they believe that's associated with some of the ASD. So when you think about sort of the neuroinflammatory component, um, what uh, is the way to potentially cool this off uh, and reduce that neuroinflammation? Uh, they believe that this uh, impaired immune regulation leads to increased inflammatory cytokine production, alters neurodevelopment, reduced um, tolerogenic state, and increased potential for autoantibody production. And so again, a, lo a lot of these kids that have also underlying autoimmune diseases, they think this is all uh, a, a cascade of uh, neuroinflammatory uh, events, which really uh, is uh, caps off with the neuroinflammation of the brain. Uh, so when you look at those same CD4 positive cells that I mentioned in um, autoimmune disease, in um, responses to immune checkpoint inhibitors that we see in autism, I mean uh, Alzheimer's patients and Parkinson's patients, people also looked at this CD4 positive cell in the context of children with autism, and they found that there was very, very high expression of that same CXCR3 uh, uh, receptor that I just showed you. Uh, and then if you look at neuroinflammation and ep epilepsy, which I, I, I heard the question before, uh, again, they found that same type of thing, there's high expression of CXCR3 and CXCL10. Uh, and so those are the things that again are allowing T cells, recruiting T cells uh, to go to the brain and cause that inflammation. Uh, and it's a common theme that you're seeing across uh, numerous publications. Um, and so they said, what are some therapeutic opportunities? Uh, that could uh, be used to treat reactive glia-derived neuroinflammation. And they said if you could target the CXCL10, CXCR3, that would be one of the areas that you could look at. And we know, again, from our work in Alzheimer's and Parkinson's, that indeed that is one of the reasons that our NK cells are at least showing some uh, positive signal up to now. Um, so, um, really, we are in the process of trying to work with the right people, as I mentioned, Judy Vandermeter, Paul Ashwood, uh, and Dr. Uh, Junha uh, in Boston, to try to come up with, if there was a rationale to potentially offer this as a means to do a clinical trial. Um, we are really just committed, just from the sake of trying to help uh, a, a, a problem for which there has still not been really good uh, effective therapies, very much like we uh, went into Alzheimer's and Parkinson's, thinking that uh, we know that neuroinflammation is one of a multiple cascade of things. We're not saying that this is a magic bullet in any way. In talking to some of the uh, autism uh, experts, they said perhaps we should first focus on children that have some underlying autoimmune diseases, uh, given that we had some of our um, Alzheimer's patients who were not verbalizing, who were all of a sudden now able to verbalize, maybe look at a subpopulation. We were very open. Uh, I think the reason I wanted to come up here today uh, was just to say, look, we're, we're, um, we care about uh, kids with this. We care about families with this. We want to try to 
uh, get involved and be part of the solution. We don't know what that entails. We don't claim to be experts, but if there are people here that would be interested in uh, collaborating with us to do things the right way, to, uh, the, you know, whether or not, what, we don't even know what type of biomarkers to look at, uh, we would be very open to uh, exploring doing that. I will say that our phase one uh, safety trials in cancer were completed. We submitted all that data to the US FDA. Uh, and the way it works with the US FDA is once you finish your phase one and show safety, if you have a scientific rationale why you think those, uh, that product can be used in another disease indication, uh, the FDA many times will allow you to then go on and do a, a, a clinical trial. So that's how we're able to do a clinical trial in Alzheimer's and Parkinson's now based on the information that I shared with you. Uh, so if, if there is some feeling that there's a rationale uh, that this could potentially work for some population of kids, we would uh, be very interested. I think some of the different talks today, I think all focus on things that we know can help improve uh, natural killer cells, whether it be the uh, microbiome uh, or uh, other exercise or all sorts of things. Uh, at the same time, you know, I think the, um, the talk that just went before, the neuroinflammation, I think there is some reason why they're seeing some uh, improvement there. Uh, I think the thing with our cells, though, it's more of a systemic thing in addition to neuro because it does also address the uh, autoimmune problems that exist below the, the neck. So um, with that, you know, again, um, please know I'm not here to tout anything in any way. We're just here to try to say, um, you know, we have some dear friends who children has this and we'd love to find a way to see if this can be part of the solution. Thank you.